Go ahead and take a seat, and I'm going to invite you to take your uh, Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is our text, and if you don't have a Bible with you and you are in one of our rooms here at Sweetwater or in Parker, then uh, grab one of the Bibles that's around you. At Sweetwater, there are the chairs around you. At Parker, there's a table in the back. Run back there and grab one of those Bibles and uh, turn to page 1035, page 1035, and you'll be able to follow along with us in Luke chapter 12. And as always, if you are here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please take one of those with you. We, we, we want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God. Same for you. If you're watching us online, whether it's your first time or you're regular, uh, we appreciate that, and we would love for you to just request a Bible if you don't have one. We will give you one, whether we mail it to you or hand deliver it, because we want everyone to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, I, I'm excited that uh, school is starting. Not that it impacts me at all because I don't have kids of school age, although I have grandkids of school age, so they're, uh, they're excited, getting ready for that. But uh, I just really appreciate our teachers that invest in helping our young people not be ignorant. So uh, thank you. It is often a thankless task. It is often a tedious task, but it is one that we are delighted that you have chosen. And thank you for pouring your lives into our children. So uh, we appreciate that. Hey, uh, oh, by the way, teachers, since we, uh, it's gonna be a, a madhouse out in the lobby afterwards, uh, look for me and the guys with their gift cards will be around me. Uh, we'll just uh, have them do that. So if you're going, how do we find the gift cards? Because some of you are here because you love Calvary and some of you are here because a friend invited you and said, hey, they're giving away money. Uh, and, uh, and we're okay with that. We, that's why we're doing it. We wanna bless you and help you have a great year. So uh, just look for me and I'll be the marker and uh, the guys with the cards will be around me. So um, that said, hey, what is the number one accusation that your unchurched friends make about the church when you invite them to come? That the church is full of... Oh, you've heard that. <laughs> How many of you have actually had that conversation with somebody where you said, hey, uh, I, wanna, I want you to come to church with me. And they went, ah, I don't want to do that. Church is full of hypocrites. How many of you actually had, okay, a lot of first person accounts, a lot of you listened in to the complaints that people share. And, uh, and so the next time you invite someone and they play the hypocrite card, don't get mad, don't make excuses, just surprise them by agreeing. Surprise them by agreeing and then just say, hey, you know what? Uh, Jesus feels that way too. Jesus feels that way too. See, the truth is every church, every organization, every group or fraternal order has hypocrites. Okay, if there's a, if there's a standard that the group uh, upholds and says they believe in, there's, it, there's always going to be hypocrites around. And because we're all sinners, every one of us is capable of our own hypocrisy. Uh, here, I'll just confess first. I'm a food hypocrite. You know, I, I go, I want to lose weight. I start, you know, a diet plan, an eating plan. I'm going to eat healthier. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to do that. And I do pretty well right up until the moment that I leave the city limits of Lake Havasu. <laughs> We're driving to Phoenix. We're driving to Vegas. We're driving to Southern California. And the first conversation that happens as soon as we get close to I-40 or I-10 is, hey, where do you want to eat when we get there? <laughs> Anybody else with me on that one? Yeah. Oh, look at this. We're all a bunch of food hypocrites. Look at that. So anyway, uh, so just agree with your friends. Hey, the church is full of hypocrites. And, and tell them that they are agreeing with Jesus. Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Very short passage. We're going to look at a longer one uh, uh, in chapter 11 in just a moment. It says, In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were trampling one another, Jesus began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Now, leaven, just for a little bit of background, is yeast. And you probably know that. Yeast is that, that thing that makes bread rise and delicious. Uh, and in the first century Israel, it was understood through the teachings of Scripture that leaven represented evil influence and that a little bit of evil influence will corrupt uh, everything. 
Now, Jesus uses this in context of the Pharisees. If you don't know what a Pharisee is, that's fine. They are the religious elite. They are the holy ones. They are men that had dedicated their lives to living out the law of God. And everybody that knew the Pharisees esteemed them as holy, righteous, and zealous for God. So Jesus is warning the crowds, and the Pharisees are listening, by the way, about the corrupting evil influence of a group of religious leaders dedicated to God. See, if, if you haven't noticed that Jesus was a rebel, Jesus was a rebel. He is saying, beware of the influence of the good guys, of these religious guys, because they will influence you toward hypocrisy. See, that's what he says, their influence is hypocrisy. And by the way, for the record, in case you haven't read this before or haven't paid attention to the Gospels, Jesus hates hypocrisy. He despises it. We know this because in the chapter right before this, in Luke 11, it records Jesus as the worst dinner guest ever. You know, there's a lot of people who say, who would you like to have for over for dinner? And everybody's like, oh, I'm at Jesus. You better think twice about that. Because Jesus is not always the polite dinner guest. Listen to, pick up in, in uh, Luke 11, verse 37. It says, while Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So Jesus went in and reclined at table. And the Pharisee was astonished to see that Jesus did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools. <laughs> That's a good dinner guest, isn't it? <laughs> Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give his alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. He doesn't stop there. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe, mint, and rue, and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves that people walk over them without knowing it. And one of the lawyers answered him, Teacher, in saying these things, you insult us. Think? <laughs> it's like, glad you're paying attention. And Jesus said, Woe to you, lawyers, also, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. I wonder if this was before dessert. Jump down to verse 52. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And you hindered, hindered those who were entering. And as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things, lying in wait to, for him to catch him in something he might say. See, do you agree? Jesus is one of the worst dinner guests ever. You know, it's, it's, that's not a pleasant, you know, meal. Uh, and, and you're going, okay, great. So Jesus was, uh, doesn't like hypocrites, and he was a rude dinner guest. What does that have to do with us? We're not Pharisees. We're not religious lawyers. Because when they talk about lawyers in the Gospels, they're talking about people who are experts in Scripture. Uh, here's why this matters. Do you want to be a hypocrite? Wow, there's like half of you that are like, I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So do you want to be a hypocrite? No. Okay, well, if you don't want to be a hypocrite, then, then this is important because we can't represent Jesus unless we reflect his character. And since we want to represent Jesus and, and we don't want to be condemned by Jesus as a hypocrite, look, I don't want to be on the other side of that dinner table. I don't want to be the one him saying, woe to me. Uh, and we don't want to get in the way of people coming to Jesus because our whole reason for existing at Calvary is that we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. So what I want to do is, is invite you to take a hypocrite quiz with me. Okay? You do not have to share your answers. You don't have to turn in your work. Uh, this is a, a quiz inspired by Jesus and influenced by Jeff Foxworthy. <laughs> See, you might be a hypocrite if... Okay, you might be a hypocrite if you value style over substance. Okay, look back again at verse 39. Jesus said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed 
and wickedness. See, they were externally following the law by cleansing their, the outside of the cup and, and pouring water over their hands. They weren't even like scrubbing or anything. But their hearts were wrong. Are you concerned with appearances? Are you worried about what other people think of you? Do you want your public life to look good even if your private life is falling apart? Breaks my heart every time a family falls apart. Every time, you know, we love families here at Calvary. We love your kids. We want to take care of your kids. That's why we've got a great children's ministry, student ministry. Uh, we, we want families to thrive and succeed. So it breaks our heart every single time a family falls apart, and we hear about it. But what drives me crazy is when you know the family, and you're asking them, hey, how are you guys doing? Oh, we're fine. We're good. Everything's good. Right up until they separate and file divorce. See, if appearance is more important than reality... Well, you might be a hypocrite. And you might be a hypocrite if you focus on compliance instead of compassion. You focus on compliance instead of compassion. Verse 42, Jesus says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. You shouldn't have done all of this without neglecting the others. Compliance. You see, the Pharisees were so into following the law. By the way, the law says you're supposed to give God a tenth of everything. That even when they were growing herbs in their garden. And they would harvest the, you know, whatever the herbs were. I, mint and rue. I don't know what that is. I know what mint is. But uh, they would like cut off a 10% 10, 10 of that little bush. And then they would give it as a tie. They were so obsessed with that. Oh, I got to follow the law at this point. But Jesus says, you don't care about people. You don't care about justice. You don't care about compassion. You don't care about the love of God. So they were concerned with doing religious duties instead of caring for people. So I just got to tell you, if your spiritual life is consumed with tasks, if you've just got to complete the task, check the box. Okay, I had my quiet time today. I read my devotion. I attended church. I even tithed. I made sure I did that. Uh, you do all that, but you're mean and nasty, you might be a hypocrite. Now, I, I share this because my experience was I grew up in churches with a lot of, quote-unquote, godly people who are mean as snakes. Okay, I, I just, I was, I, look, we didn't miss church, so I was there a lot. I got a lot of, uh, you know, experiences to judge us by, and we moved all over the country, so it wasn't just like one church. There's a lot of churches that we were part of. And, uh, and I knew a lot of godly people who were sincere, they loved God, and they were committed, and they were great people of compassion. But I also knew a lot of people who were quote-unquote godly who, who weren't. And a lot of those were leaders. They were, <laughs> I hate to say it, pastors and deacons and committee members and people who had leadership in the church. And, and they were angry and arrogant and unkind to people. Uh, maybe that's why uh, Baptist business meetings resembled fight night. You know, MMA didn't really have much on that. You just get some popcorn and go to a Baptist business meeting, you'll be entertained. So if you care more about compliance than compassion, well, you might be a hypocrite. And you might be a hypocrite if you desire public recognition, honor, and titles. 43, verse 43. Jesus says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seat in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. You love the recognition. You love the, the honor. Now look, we all like recognition. We all like being appreciated. Okay, that just, yeah, that goes. If you don't like recognition or being appreciated, then I'd like to meet you and you just tell me, no, I don't want anybody saying thank you or anything like that. So we all like that. But if it drives you to get that, that's a problem. Okay, that's an indicator. If you're driven by, if you're keeping track of who gets recognition, who gets honor, all that kind of stuff. If you need a title, if you need applause, if you love plaques, that's a warning sign. Can I just, I'm just being honest. And, and, I, and I share this because I'm going to confess that I fight this temptation. And it's your fault. Okay, I, look, I, I'm just being honest. It's your fault because Calvary's such a great church and people tell me, oh, you guys got such a great church. And I go, yeah, I know. And, and they're talking to me like it's my fault. And, and I'm like, 
No, you don't get this. And, and, I, and I love that because it opens a door because I get invited to go and speak to other churches and try to help them figure out how to reach their community so they can lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus and build a culture that's healthy and, and honors God. Okay, I love that part. But on the other hand, uh, you know, that, that whole negative side of that is I love the recognition of being the pastor of Calvary. Okay, I, it's just part of it and it, and it attacks my soul and, and I gotta fight it because this is a present ongoing temptation. So uh, I, like I notice when people insist on titles, you know, and you have to, oh, I'm doc, no, doctor this, no, doc, doctor, reverend doctor. No, you need to call me pastor. And, and, and by the way, if you're new here and you're wondering what you need to call me, Chad works. <laughs> okay, it's my name. Okay, you know, some people are like, no, I have to call you pastor because you're pastor and, and my mom would beat me if I didn't call you. I was like, all right, I'm fine with that. Your mom passed like 40 years ago, but that's fine. Uh, <laughs> if you need to do that, then that's okay. But I'm not listening for that. Uh, it doesn't offend me if you just call me by my given name. Uh, and, and I'll just be honest, I notice if I go into a church and somebody's name's plastered all over the place. Uh, I, when, I, when I came to Calvary, one of the things I hated was that the fact they had my name on the sign. And, you know, and I'm like, my name's on the sign. Nobody cares that my name is on the sign. Do you know how many unchurched people care the pastor's name is on the sign? Exactly zero. Right? They're like, well, that guy's arrogant. He's got his name on the sign. See, you know, we, we got to think about this. It, 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 so much of it is wrapped up in our pride. And so, by the way, uh, as I'm sharing this with you, uh, I also need to go ahead and tell you that we don't do a whole lot of public recognition here at Calvary. So thank you to our nameless, selfless servant volunteers that are doing such a great job around here that make this whole place work. You guys are awesome. But um, if you need recognition, uh, you might be a hypocrite. And then you might be a hypocrite if you love rules. Look at verse 46. Love rules. Jesus said, Woe to you lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. You don't help anybody. Uh, they're just making rules and expecting everyone to follow them. See, hypocrisy loves rules, especially when the person making the rules is one of the religious leaders, and it's easy for them to follow their own rules anyway. I'm sure you might have been in a church where there were a lot of rules. You can't do that. Oh, no, you have to do this. You need to show up, you need to sit down, and you need to do what we tell you to do. If not, if you don't do that, then you're being rebellious. You're being unholy. You're being ungodly. We're going to kick you out and call you names. Oh, no, you need to use this Bible. It's the only one that's good. You need to, by the way, you need to get a haircut. No, you can't get a tattoo. Sorry, Jamie. Uh, <laughs> and you need to dress appropriately. Now, who decided what appropriate is? It's probably some legalistic fashion-challenged hypocrite. Right? I, I mean, it just goes with the whole story. So, uh, by the way, uh, since I'm doing lots of confessing today, um, I hate rules. Okay? I hate rules, especially stupid rules. And uh, some of you uh, can confess with me. Now, understand when I say that, I fully embrace God's rules. There's, there's a little bit of uh, complaining about some of them, but uh, it doesn't mean I like them all, but I choose to submit to God completely. But just for the record, I question everyone else's. And Jesus broke the religious rules that these hypocrite religious leaders had instilled on all the people. And Jesus is like, oh, you want me to pour water on my hands so that uh, I'm just like you guys. And he doesn't do it on purpose. He knows it's expected, and he doesn't do it. I love that. I love that. He's just like, oh, let's see what you say. Because he knew they were going to bring it up. They knew. And he was just baiting them ready to like, I, I, I've got some things to say to you guys. So, um, just saying, if you love rules, maybe, might be, hypocrite. And then, finally, you might be a hypocrite if you obscure the truth. Verse 52, he says, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You didn't enter yourselves to the kingdom of God, and you hindered those who were trying to enter. 
They obscured the truth. Now these men studied the law of God and they were supposed to teach people about God and yet they hid the teachings of mercy and faith and compassion behind the rules of compliant religion. Their teachings made it difficult for people to find God. And that, that's probably the one that just burned Jesus the most. You're the gatekeepers and you're keeping people out. See, we never want to do that. We want people to meet Jesus. We, look, I'm just telling you, I'll be honest with you. I want you to meet Jesus. I want him to change your life. I want him to revolutionize your life. I want you to know forgiveness. I want you to know love. I want you to know the grace of God that just overflows your life so that you can't sing that song we did right before the, the message without tearing up. I want you to understand that the God of all creation thinks you are incredible and wonderful and values you so much that he sacrificed his only son for you. I want you to get that. And I don't want anything to get in the way. And, and by the way, if it's ever, if you're any place and it's ever Jesus and anything, then you're obscuring the truth. I don't care if it's Jesus and church attendance or Jesus and tithing or Jesus and reading your Bible or Jesus and anything. You surrender to Jesus and he'll take care of the rest. Because God the Holy Spirit will inhabit your life and, and, and then it's too late. Okay, because he owns you and he will change you. So, five marks of hypocrisy. I'm not going to ask how you scored because I don't want to tempt you to lie and be a hypocrite. But I do want you to know this. I do not want to be a hypocrite. Do you want to be a hypocrite? Okay, so I told you in the churches I was in, I was unintentionally raised to be a hypocrite. Okay, I, I call it Pharisee factories. They didn't know what they There's lots of rules, lots of do this, don't do that kind of stuff, and be good, and if you're good, then you're holy, and that's, you know, but good the way, anyway. So I want to discuss how to avoid hypocrisy. So even if you just went 0 for 5 on the quiz, uh, it doesn't matter, because we follow a God of grace and he can begin right here, right now to revolutionize your life. Let's talk about how to avoid hypocrisy in your life. Because if we're followers of Jesus, if we believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world, we believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins. It's personal. And you believe he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life. Well, you can't represent Jesus unless you reflect his character. And Jesus doesn't want hypocrites trying to represent him, which is why the church in America has lost power. So we need to talk about how to avoid hypocrisy in our lives. And, and there's three answers, three habits I'm going to share with you that also happen to be three of Calvary's core values. The first one is relatable truth. Relatable truth. If we read and apply God's word, God will change our lives. You may have heard that a little bit earlier in the service as we begin the service. I say that every single time I preach. I want you to read God's word. I want you to encounter God's word. And I want you to apply God's word because if you do that, God will revolutionize your life. Jesus said in John chapter 8, if you remain in my word, or if you hold to my teachings, then you are truly my disciple, and you will know the truth. And the truth, well, what, what does it do? It yeah, you see, you guys all know that. We all know the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. That's only half of it. If you hold on to teachings of Jesus, then the truth will set you free. So you got to have the first half to get to the second half. If you want freedom, it's wrapped up in what Jesus teaches. So what does he teach? Well, the truth is everyone is a sinner and needs the grace of God. Everyone is a sinner and needs the grace of God. In other words, the truth is we are not good people. Okay, we're not good people. I mean, I grew up in churches where we're, the, we're good people and bad people are out there. They're sinning and we're the good people in here. And that's a lie. We are not good people. In fact, why don't you look at the person sitting next to you and say, I am not a good person. Now, see, that person next to you is probably going, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. You don't have to tell me that. It's good that you know now. See, we sin, we fail, we rebel. We choose destruction over and over and over again. Now, hear this. Not we used to sin, 
See, I grew up in those kind of churches where we'd say, yes, we're sinners. We used to sin. They didn't say we used to, but they implied it. They kind of taught it, you know, because no one ever talked about present sin in their lives. They always talked about, well, in the past, a long time ago. <laughs> right? See, a lot of hypocrites will talk about sin in the past tense, but I'm talking about present tense. We, we're, we're not good people. We're sinners. See, I like to say I am a scum-sucking pig sinner. Okay? <laughs> That's your pastor. Sorry if that offends you, but that's who I am. Not who I was, but it's who I am. Okay? See, Jesus changes us, and he's changed me, and, but, but here's the thing. My renewed self still inhabits a sin-addicted body. I, I get a new one one day, but it's not yet there. So I'm a redeemed sinner. I'm destined for heaven. I'm in love with Jesus, but I still crave the muck and mud of sin. And I can hate that about myself, but it doesn't change the reality that it's true. And the only hope we have is a life-changing relationship with Jesus. See, we're not good people, so we need the grace of God to forgive us of our sins and give us eternal life because we're not going to get there by being good enough. Now, if we truly want to avoid hypocrisy, we must embrace and apply the truth of Scripture, which means the Bible needs to be the mirror for your soul. Why do I keep telling you I want you to read this and apply this? Because this is the mirror for our soul and it drives us to the feet of Jesus where we ask him to change us. So if you want to avoid uh, being a hypocrite, then practice relatable truth and practice transparent living. Transparent living. Let's get to chapter 12 again, verse 2. Jesus said, Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Now, that can either scare you to death or make you glad. Because there's a lot of people who are like, oh, no. By the way, transparent living, God desires us to be real, open, and honest about who we are and allow others to do the same. And that is so frightening to people who grew up in the Pharisee factories like me. Because uh, we didn't want anybody. Can I, I just be honest with you guys? I, I grew up kind of being taught that, and, and, if, and if you've shared this, you can come and, and uh, we can have a little therapy session afterwards in the lobby. But uh, I grew up kind of being told and taught that one day at judgment, you know, I was going to be there and it was going to be like being at a giant drive in movie theater and everybody's going to watch your life and all of your evil actions and evil thoughts that took place. <laughs> and everybody's like, it's going to be like, I almost even say it. Uh, but it was like, ah! You know, it's this horrible idea. And I'm like, uh, but theirs would be just as bad. I'd, I'd get old. We're going to spend the first billion years of eternity just like watching bad movies. And uh, <laughs> I don't think so. And by the way, can I, can I just tell you, God doesn't encourage hiding. He exposes us. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He brings things into the light. Adam and Eve... Our ancestors and the first sinners, uh, they disobeyed God. One stinking rule, and they couldn't follow it. They disobeyed God, and, and what did they do after they sinned? They hid. They hid. And by the way, we got their DNA. We got their spiritual DNA. So every time we sin, we want to hide. We want to, like, cover it up, even though it's pathetic. And, and so we're all sinners, and, I, and our inherent hypocrisy tempts us to hide our struggles and pretend everything is fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Freedom is found in confession. It's found in confession. Just to admit your failures. Receive forgiveness. Live in freedom from guilt and shame. And there's some of you are going, I really want that, but I don't want to tell anybody what I've done. See, hypocrisy tells us to hide our failures and fear discovery. And you cannot live in joy if you're scared to death that people are going to find out who you really are. Amen. You're spending all your energy trying to keep it, you know, undercover and make sure that you don't let anything slip about who you used to be or who you really are. And, and hypocrisy tells us that people will judge us and reject us. And it really might happen among religious people who are hypocrites. But it won't happen in Jesus' crowds. It's not going to happen here at Calvary. We're not going to judge you. I mean, we already told you we're just as messed up as you are. We're just not worried that you're going to find out about it. Because there is freedom in confession. We're on a journey of freedom. That's what grace does for us. 
So if you want to avoid hypocrisy, embrace transparent living, apply the truth of God's word, and then engage in radical service. Radical service. Followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service. Followers of Jesus best demonstrate love to others through acts of kindness and service. Love, by the way, in case you hadn't noticed, is a verb. It's an action. For God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave. Yeah, it's, a, it's action. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. You got to do something to the, you know, another. That's, that's what love is. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, I encourage you to go home and read it, uh, says this, love is patient and love is kind. Those are actions that you take towards people. Hypocrisy talks about love but embraces an ethic of abstinence. In case you don't know what an ethic of abstinence is, it kind of goes something like this. I don't drink, smoke, cuss, or chew, or run with girls that do. <laughs> In other words, it's an ethic of uh, I'm good because I abstain from bad stuff. Okay? Hypocrisy promotes a passive holiness. In other words, it was really important when I was growing up, you know, if you're going to be good, you can't do all this stuff. And so your basic argument was, I'm holy because I don't. That's not what love says. Right? I'm holy because I don't. I don't drink. I don't, I don't, I don't dance. I don't play cards. I don't gamble. I don't do, I don't do that. And, and, and yet, you also don't have joy and you don't love people and you don't help and you don't serve and, you, and, and all that kind of stuff. Jesus calls us to love in action. I'm loving because I act. I am patient. I am kind. I'm helping. I'm blessing. And serving others is love in action. And we serve at Calvary. That's why radical service is one of our core values, in case you missed it. We serve our community to convince them that we're not a bunch of hypocrites. You guys thought, oh, I just thought we want to make our community better. Yeah, we do want to make our community better, but we also want to convince people who don't know God and don't know Jesus and aren't interested in church that maybe we're a little bit different. That maybe we're not a bunch of hypocrites because we're actually doing something for people and not just telling them how to live their lives. Uh, we want to convince the community that we care. And so we encourage you to serve to convince them of that, but also so that you can learn how to love better because love is a verb and serving helps us to do that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, and be really uh, blunt today after the service at all of our campuses, that means you too, Parker, uh, that uh, we got tables set up for you to volunteer to serve. You're like, oh, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go out the other ways then. I don't wanna be by those tables. Look, we've got ministries that bless people. And, and I already told you, we've got great servant leaders, but we need more of them because we, got, we want to reach an entire community. We need help with that. And I know a lot of you volunteer the projects, but we need some people to help us with the week-to-week, -week, you know, ongoing things. So student ministries, children's ministries. You know, there's like 5,000 students in our district. That's not counting the charter schools in our school. 5,000 kids in town. We might ought to care about them. We got worship and tech ministry, so if you love the spotlight and actually have talent, you should go talk to them. If you love making, you know, controlling everybody and being the one in charge, go talk to them about tech. You know, we've got uh, hospitality. We've got first impressions. If you're a friendly person and you like saying hi, volunteer for first impressions. It's like the easiest job that, that there is. Just stand there and say, hey, glad you're here. Glad you're here. As long as you're not a liar, it's good. Okay. <laughs> not like you're here. Oh, no. It, we've got a security team, and, and I'm just going to say it. If you're a retired law enforcement or first responder, you, you know, or, or somebody who always wanted to be, but, uh, you know, hey, look, go talk to them. <laughs> go, go talk to them. They'll, you know, we, we want to make sure everybody and everybody's property stays safe while we're here. We got life groups. We got, you know, just go back there and check them out. And in case you're, like, still not sold, uh, go by the tables. They all have treats. Find out who has the best candy. Uh, <laughs> And, and by the way, Parker, there's a table set up for you guys too, so go by and check that out. You don't know if you have as many varieties, but you've got a table back there you can find out about helping out and serving. So we don't want to be hypocrites. 
We want to truthfully and transparently serve people so that we can lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And I'm praying that you want to pursue that like I want to pursue that. Because the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy, and Jesus wants us to beware. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Can't believe that you love us. But it is true, and it is life-changing. And so today we just ask that you would meet us here and speak to our hearts. God, for the ways that we've been hypocrites, we need your grace, and we invite you to, to forgive us. We ask that you'd forgive us. Lord, for the ways that we want to protect against being hypocrites, uh, speak truth to our lives. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. And God, help us to live consistent lives that honor Jesus. And Father, help us to want to serve. Not to do it because we have to or because it's expected, but because we are grateful that you have changed our lives. Most of all, God, we want to live our lives with such authenticity that people don't dare call us a hypocrite. Only you can make that happen. So we give ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.